Okay. Ian, many consider Aqualung to be Jethro Tull's crowning achievement. Can you tell us about the album? Aqualung, actually, a lot of people think was a concept album, but um, in fact, the, the original, or the title track derived from uh, some ideas for some lyrics that my then wife had uh, come up with as a result of, uh, she was a, f a photography student and had come back with some photographs of various uh, homeless people, you know, old dossers around the sort of East London area and had penned a few words, you know, which, you know, looked like some good notion for song lyrics and we kind of, you know, together kind of made a song up out of it. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, that particular song and some of the other songs that surrounded the uh, the nucleus of the album. I mean, once you've got four or five songs together, you kind of look at it and say, oh, something, you know, there are some common denominators in this lyrical material. So then you perhaps then go and write the, the extra songs so that they fit in in some way. But it, it wasn't a concept album so much as a song, a collection of songs that had a, a feel about them. What made it look more like a concept album was the execution of the cover, the liner notes, um, everything kind of just somehow pointing to there being some underlying, you know, celestial theme, you know, some cosmic truth about to be unveiled or whatever. Um, and everybody immediately thought it was a concept album. Well, I mean, that surprised me. And I remember at the time in all the interviews that I did saying, no, it's not a concept album at all, but it doesn't matter whether you say it or not. People, they get that in their heads, they believe it. Um, or as thick as a brick, the album after that, I then had got, by then, used to the idea that I was supposed to now be the author of concept albums. I thought we'd do one, you know. In fact, we did two. We did Thick as a Brick and Passion Play after it. But again, after that, we got well away from that and went back to just collections of songs again. Although I've always felt that striking that middle balance, which I think we did with Aqualung and subsequently with War Child and Songs from the Wood and, and albums up to the present day, was just that idea of taking a number of songs that you start with, seeing when things start to happen, when you start to get a little few notional, lyrical, uh, common themes, common ideas, then you, you try and expound on it a little bit. You try and build on that and make your album cover your design work and your, the way you do the show. You, you try and reinforce those original ideas rather than you know, just spreading them thin. You, you try and reinforce it. But I don't believe we make concept albums other than those, those two, and certainly not in the case of Aquila. What it did do that might have been a little unusual for the time, although people will remember Aqualung as, you know, perhaps Jethro Tull, sort of much more of a rock band. I mean, there were a lot of acoustic songs on the album interspersed between the, the, the heavier songs, and uh, it was probably the first time in that, that uh, I, I don't know what you would call it, probably contemporary folk influence had somehow lived side by side with heavy rock. Um, and it was always very difficult to make that work on stage because even now we do concerts, a number of people out there who, who particularly like to hear the acoustic songs, you know, and, and there are perhaps more people who particularly want to hear the heavy rock songs. And even now there's still that in, in difficulty of making the two things work side by side on a purely practical level because obviously strumming an acoustic guitar and singing something supposedly gently and emotional is a bit hard to do if you just wrecked your voice screaming the, the rock song before it. You know, it, it gets tricky to have the finesse to make those things work together, which is my explanation for the dismal failure that we've been responsible for all these years. <laughs> That's not true. No, I'm being, I'm being modest, but it's uh, safer. <laughs> How is, how is Jethro Tull in the 80s different than Jethro Tull in the 70s and 60s? Um, I attempted to find that on stage every night to the audience, but I use certain words that are not permissible on daytime television. Um, so I won't, uh, we'll leave it till the late showing. Um, just, no, I mean, basically we're, we, are, uh, we are older, and being older presumably means that you, you might be Peter Pan forever, you know, in, in some ways, mentally when you get up on a stage but you can't pretend to you can't have a lifestyle that just forevermore emulates your behavior at the age of 18 19 20 or whatever and obviously you take on responsibilities marriage children 
overdrafts, mortgages, <laughs> the usual stuff. And uh, clearly, you have to not let that intrude on your music, if possible, uh, nor do you really want to reflect it in your music, because it's pretty boring stuff. Uh, well, at least the, the, the overdrafts are. And um, you would therefore like to try and separate your life into the side that is practical and, you know, down to earth, normal by most people's standards, and, and the part of you that is a, a musician and dealing with that sort of flimsy, creative kind of a world. And I think it, it, it maybe gets easier as you get older to, to separate those two things. And um, people who meet me off stage or backstage or whatever think, oh, you know, cool, isn't he boring? He's a really sort of normal guy, just kind of sits there reading a book or playing table tennis or something. Or, uh, and then suddenly, you know, in that brief moment between getting to the top of the steps that lead to the back of the, st the stage and walking out into the spotlight, something happens, you know. Well, nothing actually happens at all, except I walk into the spotlight. I mean, there's really no difference, but everybody perceives it as being, you know, and, you know, like a sort of real chameleon change. Um, I think that just gets easier. You get less paranoid about the differences between your private life and a, your apparent appearance on stage. It fits into place. It maybe gets easier to do in the sense that it, if you survive the first uh, 10 years of being a, a rock musician on the road and making records and enjoying some level of success, you'll probably su survive the next 10 or 20. Because um, you, you probably learn to cope with it most of the time. I mean, I crack up on alternate Wednesdays, but other than that, I'm okay. Um, let's talk about some other bands and, and their effect on progressive rock, if you think they have any. Um, Genesis, how do you think they fit as a band into the whole progressive rock picture? Well, I never had the fortune to see Genesis in their early days, because they began um, more or less around the same time as we did, and we all seem to be on tour. You know, the same, I mean, never actually just got to see them, never crossed paths with them at all. Uh, we used to hear a lot about them, you know, from promoters and um, sometimes from fans of the group who would appear to be fans of Genesis as well. Um, I think perhaps there were some similarities between the bands in, in the early days. They uh, obviously suffered their lineup changes and the change of emphasis in you know, in the sort of focus of the group, just as, as Jethro Tull did in its way. But uh, I, guess I, I think they're probably a very important group. They're one that have survived uh, through ultimately being good musicians, doing a good performance. And obviously it's a band, but you can't escape the fact that Phil Collins, as a, as a particularly as a vocalist, I mean, is just really terrific. He's a great, uh, very talented singer. Apart from being a drummer, and musician, writer, whatever else he might be, he's a, he's a great singer, and uh, it's great to be a great singer. <laughs> so, I mean, he's always got that talent to fall back on, even without original material, even without perhaps being, uh, uh, if Genesis, and I'm not saying they are, but if they were considered by critics to be no longer in the uh, the front ranks of you know creative, forward-going groups, at least there is a level of performance you know, from all of the band, but particularly Phil Collins, even if all the, even if the only material they had to work with was, uh, uh, you know, Tamla Motown hits of 15 years ago, they would, if that's all they did, they'd still be terrific because they would do it in a, in a great way. It would sound terrific and they would put something special of their own into it. So they, they, they have a, you know, a lasting place. But, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to sound critical of them any more than anybody else, but, Somehow, bands like the Pink Floyd, for me, still, right up until the last, were still flying in the face of everything that seemed sensible. Same with David Bowie. I mean, David Bowie's great because he's always getting into trouble. I mean, he's always do it. Having been successful, he then seems to really just go the other way, take a different tack, and immediately people, you know, get really upset with him again, which is, is fantastic. That, that I really respect. I wish I was as brave, you know. Um, but uh, that, 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 that I really do respect is when people are capable of uh, about turns in direction, especially when, it, when they've been successful, you know, then to, to say, OK, fine, I've done that. I don't need to do that one again. I'll take a different move this time. I think that's, that's, uh, that's you know, very laudable. What about King Crimson? 
King Crimson, I think, were very um, uh, interesting at the time they, they first appeared on the scene. I mean, they came along with early Traffic, Spooky Tooth, Yes, Jethro Tull. All, all those bands were bands that played at the Marquee Club in London, which spawned, before that, the first wave of blues groups, you know, the Rolling Stones and Alexis Corner and all those guys that began there. Um, subsequently, the, the sort of progressive music boom of the late 60s, early 70s, all the most of the bands we've been talking about have you know, been marquee resident groups. Um, and uh, Crimson, along with Traffic, you know, were two bands that I used to regularly go and see there because they were, uh, I mean, a very charged atmosphere when both of those bands played. I mean, maybe it wasn't we played as well, I don't know, but it was great when they played. I used to go and watch them. It was, you couldn't, you know, what they were playing, again, had that sort of eclectic thing about it. You couldn't quite define uh, where it was all coming from, you know, in terms of influences, but it, it, it was a really electric atmosphere. Um, obviously not as melodic as groups like Yes, um, not as uh, exciting in terms of virtuosity as, as the Nice were in those days, when Keith Emerson was throwing daggers into uh, Leslie cabinets. Um, they again were another marquee resident band, you know, at the time we were. Um, but, but certainly King Crimson had that something special, something pretty tortuous about them and something very unsettled. But so they always gave the impression of being a band that wasn't going to stay intact for very long, you know. As Traffic also seemed very precarious, you know, a band that just somehow looked as if it was going to break apart any second, you know, because it was, on a good night, they were just fantastic. On a bad night, they were really roping on together. You know, they were very variable, all those bands. and. Uh, Whereas bands like Yes tended to be more consistent, you know, they would not have so many ups and downs. And similarly, the Nice were really solid and reliable, you know, neat to the last dagger throw every night, you know, it would be just right. That's all my questions. Terrific. Well, we ran out early, didn't we? Well, no, we've, <laughs> we did 25 minutes. Good. Can you think of any closing statements? I mean, I, I could think of a whole script worth of closing statements, but I. I you know, obviously would lo love to do that and would love to have had a few things, you know, prepared yeah. to have said, which I was going to do today anyway, um, for tomorrow mm -hmm. under the original thing, because there, there were actually a few, I mean, you might as well just stop turning over now, chaps, but the, the, the thing that, uh, there, were, there were some points in the thing that I, I managed to get to one of them about the Beatles, which mm -hmm. I mean was that they yes. were, certainly they were very influential <coughs> in pointing the way, but I don't think they were progressive rock, but you, you did have in the script Spandau Ballet, mm -hmm. which uh, I seem to remember we discussed at the time. I mean, not that I'm saying they should be in or out, but I, I personally find them very difficult to relate to in context. I mean, I was watching a, a video clip of Spandau on television this morning. I mean, they're, they are arch wimps, you know. I mean, they're really so drippy, it's not true. And so poppy, you know, that I mean, it's hard, hard to see them in the context. But uh, who have you managed to get additional material of? I mean, you mentioned Dave Gilmore. Obviously. David Gilmore, I, interview, I interviewed today. In London today, they did an interview with Jim Capaldi. Mm -hmm. We also have an interview with Steve Howe. Um, I believe, I don't have my list in front of me. There's, there's three other interviews that are happening in London besides Capaldi and, and Steve Howe. Mm. And I can't. I can't think it's of Keith that. Emerson over here now, because he would have been great.